G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel today, recording from my new home in Macclesfield in England. It has been a tumultuous few days in my life. I spent the morning here catching up on the round of football that was, and today's video I'm going to take you through uh, my thoughts on the nine games that took place in round eight. Before we get into the video, I will address the elephant in the room, um, this weird mustache thing that I've got going on. To be honest with you, I kind of did it half as a joke to weird out my sister. She hates mustaches. And the other half is not a joke at all. I've discovered Ted Lasso and it's just such a good show. But in addition to this uh, interesting mustache that I've got going on, I've also been able to keep up with my manscaping routine while on holiday as well. So if you too want to level up your manscaping routine, you can get 20% off and free shipping thanks to our friends at Manscaped by using the code TRUEFOOTY20 on all your male grooming needs. Whether it be the Lawnmower 4.0 body hair trimmer, the Weed Whacker nose and ear hair trimmer, or your liquid formulations, your ball moisturizers, you get great products, you get a great discount by using that code, so make sure you get around it. So round eight kicked off between Carlton and Brisbane at Marvel Stadium. This was one of the juicier uh, prospective games, I thought, going into this round, two quality sides. Uh, and after halftime, Brisbane really changed that perception of them perhaps being evenly ranked sides, running away to win this game by five goals. It was a pretty even first half, but the Lions really kicked away in that third quarter. And the win was largely instrumented by Josh Dunkley, who probably had his best game for the Lions. He had 33 disposals, 11 marks, 13 tackles, and a monstrous 172 fantasy points, which was great for my team. He played on Patrick Cripps, and by contrast, Cripps had a very quiet game with just 17 touches and three clearances. And it was a pretty lackluster second half from the Blues and that led to you can feel a lot of angst at the moment from Carlton fans are feeling frustration after dare I say a downhill ski of a performance against West Coast where they pumped a struggling side by 108 points and then get found out at home against the Brisbane Lions you can feel the frustration Nick Newman has had a real purple patch of form and he's done some jobs on a couple of forwards in the last few weeks but Charlie Cameron bobbed up for four goals in this game which was largely in instrumental and in terms of one-on-one -on -one shutdown roles Jackson Payne also did a really good job on Charlie Curnow after his nine goals last week against the Eagles kept him to one goal as well and unfortunately the Blues slipped to eighth on the ladder after this loss and fair enough there are some questions about their legitimacy this year on the Saturday morning at Richmond it then defeated the Eagles by 46 points this game more or less went to script as how I expected it the Eagles were able to spend two and a half quarters more or less uh, in touch with Richmond if not dominating they probably had some aspects of the game on their terms but it didn't really last long and the top end quality of Richmond won out in particular Taranto and Hopper went large as did Dion Prestia who kicked three goals in about five minutes Bolton again was very very classy in this game 31 touches seven clearances the Eagles did okay to hang in there for two and a half quarters but ultimately a 10 goal to four second half uh, put the contest to bed so 46 points was about right on a positive note for the Eagles uh, Oscar Allen is having a fantastic season in probably Probably the worst side in the competition. He bobbed up for four goals. He's got 22 for the season, and I believe his previous best is 28 in a season, uh, which is just remarkable. So top five in the Commons is a really good result. But unfortunately, there's more injury bad news for the Eagles here with Jai Cully doing an ACL, which is just heartbreaking. So his season's over. In a year where the Eagles are wanting games into their promising youth, him going down is just almost typical at this point. Then Geelong took on the Adelaide Footy Club at GMHBA Stadium, and I didn't realize that Adelaide had not won at this ground since 2003. It's not a happy hunting ground for a lot of touring sides, but Adelaide's streak there, that actually predates West Coast last win there, which is saying something. But to go down by 26 points is a fairly solid result considering, you know, the strength of Geelong and how they've kind of returned to the form that threatens to be a premiership contender again this year. They started the game well. They had something like the first seven inside 50s uh, before, you know, the Cats managed a small quarter time lead and then kicked five of the next six goals and Adelaide did have a response I think to get within nine points in that third quarter it does show the, the progression that they're at this is a tough ground a tough opponent they didn't go all the way and win but I think 26 points with where they're at at the moment is quite respectable obviously the next test that Adelaide has is to start winning some of these tough away games they've more or less been pretty strong in Adelaide and then notch the easy away wins when they come up but I've got a couple of interesting tests coming up against the Dogs I think is their next away game and then the Suns are after that from the cat side of things, it was a pretty run-of-the-mill cats performance where you know the regular stars did well. Tom Stewart, Dangerfield before he got injured, Mitch Duncan as well. The interesting stat though was that eight of the cats that played in this game were actually not in the grand final side. So it does indicate some depth there, although it's not really a big shock, is it? Then we had probably the game of the round between the Gold Coast Suns and Melbourne down at, or uh, well, up there actually at Metricon Stadium. The D's winning this game by just five points and I was hoping for a thrilling game, but it certainly lived up to that expectation. Darcy McPherson had the chance to tie it all up in the dying stages. I think with 14 seconds left on the clock, he sprayed a set shot pretty averagely 
um, which cost them the game, unfortunately. But to hang with the Ds for all four quarters in the way they did is uh, it's a tick of the box, I would say. I think the margin was never more than seven points at any change, and at three-quarter time, the game was all even. So for all four quarters, the Gold Coast Suns were able to stay with one of the best sides of the competition, probably top two side. We know Melbourne are a fit side. They, that's a hallmark of their team over the last few years, even without Burgess. They've actually won all eight of their final quarters this year, but the Suns really made them work for it. In particular, the coalface with Raul and Anderson combining for something like 21 clearances. They actually had more clearances than the Demons in this game. When you consider the strength of the midfield they're coming up against, that was a pretty good result. And Noah Anderson in particular was just an absolute beast. 36 disposals, 10 clearances himself, three goal assists, one goal. It's a performance that will see him get three Brownlow votes, I hope. Certainly in the absence of Took Miller right now as well, his ascension to be potentially become an absolute genuine A-grade midfielder would be very handy right about now. The Ds record an important four points in the sense that it was a danger game for them. They got challenged. They walk away with a W, and by contrast, the Suns walk away with an L, but over the last three weeks, we've seen a definite improve in their form, and with West Coast next week, they're likely to make it three from four. Then GWS took on the Western Bulldogs at Manuka, and this game, yeah, more or less lived up. It was a pretty good contest between two sides that are historically, uh, they don't really like each other. There's a bit of a rivalry there. It was a very wet and contested game, and the game went to pretty much the last five minutes for the Dogs to hold on to a 15-point win. The Giants have now lost nine in a row at Manuka, which is their home away from home but I don't think there's any shame in this one they lost Toby Green before the opening bounce he's probably their most important player probably certainly their best player actually maybe Tom Green also lays claim to that but to be you know five and a half goals down at three quarter time to get within you know a couple of goals in the dying minutes that was a pretty good effort the gallant defeat sort of narrative is one that's followed the Giants a little bit this year but considering my own lowly expectations for them this year. To be tracking along with some of these sides but ultimately lose, when you consider the youth of the list, this one does go down as an honourable loss. Bontempelli is having probably a Brownlow quality season. I've no idea if he's actually going to win it, but the absolute brutality of this guy as an inside mid, as well as being the damaging scoring sort of outside classy player as well. This guy had like 25 contested possessions, 14 clearances, which I think both of those stats were a career best for him. He's always recording really high tackle numbers. He had seven in this game as well. He really is a barometer player for the dogs. On the other side of things, Tom Green, the player I just alluded to, he had one of his best games statistically anyway with three goals and 38 possessions and has been a genuine breakout star this season. The dogs have now won five of their last six after their 51 point loss against St Kilda. That game sort of etches in my memory as the game where it kind of turned from that point. And now for the first time this season, they find themselves inside the eight. Then Fremantle took on Hawthorne at Optus Stadium on Saturday night in the Starlight game. And this game had a bit of intrigue to it in the sense that I'm sure it wasn't just me who was wondering, could Fremantle actually drop this? So such was their, their form was so unconvincing going into this game that we thought there was a chance and they needed to not only win this game, but make a bit of a statement and win convincingly. And to be fair to them, that's exactly what they did. Yes, it was against the lowly Hawthorne who now take back 18th spot and uh, pick one, potentially. There's this little side narrative going in amongst the fans of the bottom teams. Who's going to get Harley Reid at the end of the year? But anyway, the Dockers will take some really strong positives out of this. In particular, Luke Jackson's best game for the club. He had 24 possessions, 16 of those contested, and he kicked a couple of goals as well. And the contested possessions, this was actually the first time Fremantle had won the contest possession count in a game this season. Brayshaw bobbed up with his 33-2 and two goals, such a wonderful, consistent player, and Young and Ryan in particular for back half. They were really promising. Young had something like six inside 50s. By contrast, Hawthorne didn't really get a lot out of this game. I think the midfield battle, they were sort of on top in early stages, but fell away badly and conceded something like 12 of the last 15 goals. So I think it's sort of the similar case of West Coast over the last couple of weeks where a side has been showing some good resistance and perhaps they got a little bit tired and the damn wall broke. It was a pretty good three weeks for them, but they got shown up in this game. Then we get into the Sunday games and another game that I was really intrigued to watch. And again, lived up to expectation was Port Adelaide when they beat Essendon by five points at Adelaide Oval. I nearly said Amy Stadium there. Wow. It was two finals quality sides, I would say, going head to head. Powell walk away with a win, but Essendon really made them work for it. And they had a really fast start. I think they had their first eight set of clearances of the game on their way to a six goal opening term and a 14 point halftime lead. And you really thought Essendon might walk away with this one. But as it would happen, the power would fight back, reclaim the narrow lead in the third term and ultimately win the game uh, by a small margin. But when you consider the inaccuracy of Port Adelaide in this game, in theory, they could have won by more. They had a lot of fast breaks and looked threatening going forward, but ultimately the end product wasn't quite there. And the scoring speaks for itself. 12 goals, 20 to 13 goals, nine. 
Essendon's defense in this game deserve a lot of credit when you factor in they conceded something like 65 inside 50s to just 47. And then again, their forward line proficiency as well. That was where they got the better of Port Adelaide. But for the power, it's their fifth straight win now since that showdown loss that was quite disappointing. Everyone was coming out with pitchforks at Ken Hinckley. I'll include myself in that. Not so much on Hinckley himself, but weird Jekyll and Hyde performances from Port. They really settled now. And this is a win to take to the bank. This was a good performance. It's a frustrating loss for the Dons because you feel those sorts of wins could be the difference between finals or not at the end of the year. And I certainly think they're a finals quality side right now. But I do think the fact that they were resilient in this game and didn't get blown off the park when you consider the inside 50 deferential, I think that really does show the maturity we're seeing under Brad Scott. Then Collingwood took on Sydney at the MCG and won this game by five goals in the end. And if you just looked at the scoreline, you'd think this game was a pretty comfortable win for the Pies, and I guess it was, but for three quarters, this game was neck and neck and a really good contest. When you look at the stats for the game, all the highest possession winners were all swans, and in the end, they had something like 80 more possessions, but 12 less inside 50, so they had no trouble finding the footy, but just overused it a little bit. By contrast, you know, Collingwood were a lot more efficient going forward, it has to be said. Errol Golden had pulled out a really strong performance, and certainly in terms of statistics, with 37 touches and 13 marks. He's another player I just bought in my game day squad. Luke Parker had 34, and again, it was just Sydney players all at the top, but ultimately the difference was a much more efficient Collingwood side. Brody Majacek kicked his first bag of five at AFL level, which I did not know at the time. Naturally, when you watch a Collingwood game, you're thinking, what's Nick Dacos doing? Especially if you've got him in one of your fantasy sides, but he was closely watched by Ryan Clark in the first half, and he was still around. He still had 13 touches, but they moved him out of the back line into the midfield, and he added 12. So it was funnily enough a quiet day for Dacos by usual standards but he still had 25 touches. It was interesting as well the ruck battle with Billy Frampton in there now in the absence of Darcy Cameron and he actually got the better of both Laddams and McLean. The Swans now sit 11th on the ladder no change but they've lost four of their last five games now and it's getting to that point where the margin for error for them to rescue their season is getting smaller and smaller. And finally, saving the worst for last almost, North Melbourne versus St Kilda at Marvel Stadium on Sunday. I say that disrespectfully. I'm an Eagles fan. All of our games suck. But this game was atrocious. I did predict a slugfest, actually. I thought the Saints would win comfortably, but they'd keep North Melbourne to something like 30-odd points, and that's almost exactly what happened. And that's why I'm a genius, and you should subscribe and forget everything that I've said in the past that was wrong. The scoring in particular was uh, quite interesting in this game, with two sides combining for 12 goals, 26. I think the Saints kicked 8 goals, 16, and the Roos 4 goals, 10. So a lot of points left on the table. The Roos were 0 goals, 7 at halftime, which I think was the first time they have gone goalless in at half since... Uh, uh, 1979. Anyway, I don't know how much there is to dissect out of this game. St Kilda are now third on the ladder. They're probably third or fourth best side in the comp, depending on how you write Brisbane. And to be fair to them, I'd say this wasn't their best display of their form. Perhaps it was a bit of an off day, but the fact that they still notched up a pretty comfortable five goal win speaks to some sort of maturity there. For North Melbourne, obviously there's been a really rough patch of form since round two of their win over Fremantle in Perth. And in particular, the scoring has really dried up. And we know St Kilda are a, a good defensive side who can strangle the opposition but their last three scores were 54 49 and 34 this game and when you consider Nick Larky gets three of those four goals it's an area of concern I would say for sure overall not a great game but St Kilda would be satisfied to walk away from that game with four points and again it speaks to a bit of a grit and determination about this group Perhaps it's not the biggest compliment to say after they've just beaten North Melbourne by five goals, but I do wonder if in previous years St Kilda would have made a bit of a meal of this game. Anyway, guys, that is my thoughts on round eight. Let me know in the comments what you agree with, what you disagree with. Druzy should be bobbing up with his nine things I learned pretty soon. Got a couple of ideas for videos this week. Maybe a look at some breakout players. My tipping video will be back. My game day squad update as well. I do fly to Greece this week as well, but... I'm hoping to get all these videos out so it won't interrupt our usual programming, but appreciate you guys watching. Hope you're still enjoying the content and I'll see you the next one. Cheers.